This episode of Onward to Victory is proudly presented by WCScreens.com. Just like your fighting Irish, WCScreens.com is top-notch, the absolute gold standard. For all your screen printing and embroidery needs, look no further than our friends at WCScreens.com. And on with the show. A riot on Notre Dame's campus over milk? Wildly incorrect head coaching records in the official program media guide? The first pickup football game on Notre Dame's campus was played for what prize? How about the best Irish quarterback you may never have heard of? Or how about the football game where Notre Dame missed 20 extra points? It's going to be Bedlam, and welcome to the first edition of Alex's Irish Anecdotes. So buckle up those chin straps, Irish fans. This is Onward to Victory. Hello, Irish fans, and welcome to Onward to Victory, a Notre Dame football podcast. My name is Alex Painter, and welcome to the show and to episode number 64. Man, wherever you're listening from, please know that I am grateful you're here with me at Onward to Victory, your favorite Notre Dame pod since 2019. Have you tuned into the last episode? Well, if you haven't, you oughta. It formally marked the third anniversary of the show, and it was about the dramatic story of the Great Fire of 1879. And how that catastrophic event that could have led to the university's demise ultimately led to the most iconic landmark on campus. And how it was the resolve of the French founding father of the university, the at the time aging Father Edward Soren, who showed the true fighting Irish spirit. And he turned that terribly negative event in university history to just an absolute unequivocal positive. So go check it out. By the way, head over to the Facebook page. I am modeling one of our 2022 t-shirts designed and printed by our good friends at WCScreens.com. If you're interested in purchasing an Onward to Victory shirt, feel free to jump over to paypal.me slash Onward to Victory, leave your size and address, and I'll get you in the next order. And if you've already ordered one, hey, please take a picture of yourself wearing it, share it with the audience, I'd appreciate it. So I have a bit of a different kind of offering for you today. Part of what I always kind of find fun about doing the show is presenting stories that aren't often heard or told now regarding the history of Notre Dame and her football team. But oftentimes, I'll have a pretty cool story or episode idea that I just can't flesh out into a full 35 to 40 minute episode. So for today's episode, I suppose inspired by a little series I'm writing or at least I'm starting to write for the show's website, which again, onward to victory.blog, shameless plug, go visit and bookmark that page just as soon as you can. I'm going to present a few shorter stories that maybe didn't merit a full-fledged episode, but I think you may find interesting nonetheless. So this is the first volume of Alex's Irish Anecdotes. And if you enjoy this format, I might continue doing them. So make sure if you do enjoy this, this kind of episode, you let me know. But before we jump into the first anecdote, let me first thank some special folks, starting with the show's consensus All-Americans, who support the show with their monetary donations, in addition to, of course, listening and sharing. These kind folks are Michael Finan of Rutherford, New Jersey, Brad Glazier of Williamsburg, Indiana, Will Fuller of Warren, Ohio, and also to Dr. Jeremy Scarlett of Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. If you'd like to get your name called as a consensus All-American, Please feel free to visit the virtual tip jars, if you will, at paypal.me slash onward to victory for a one-time donation or patreon.com slash onward to victory podcast if you'd like to pledge ongoing monthly support. And also, I'd be remiss not to mention, if you are new here and you're trying to figure out where that toe tapper, that intro song, that theme song, if you will, came from, 
That is, of course, from our pal Joseph Rakish. It's his song, Knut Rockney, which tidily serves as the show's theme song. You can listen to Knut Rockney and all of other Joseph's material at Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Music, YouTube, however it is that you digest music. So make sure you head over there and give him a listen as well. So I have five stories today, and I will present them in rough chronological order. But I'm going to start here right after this quick break. See, I told you it'd be quick. Now, our first anecdote sets us back a little bit, all the way back to the 1870s. Now, the program and history books have always done a great job informing us that the first game in Notre Dame football history was held on November 23rd, 1887, against the University of Michigan. This fact is indisputable. And when the first official team was banded together... Here's a fun fact for you. There were actually 15 men that came out to that very first practice. However, only 11 suited up for that first Michigan game because, well, they only had 11 uniforms. But what is never discussed, or at least I've, I've never heard it actually discussed, is when the sport of football actually arrived on Notre Dame's campus. In other words, surely they didn't decide one day to play and The University of Michigan just happened to be waiting in the wings for the lads at Notre Dame, right? No, of course not. But when was that first documented instance of Notre Dame playing football on campus? Now, I poured through the school newspaper, and I can share that the first documented mention of Notre Dame students actually playing football on campus is from an issue of the school newspaper. It's called the Notre Dame Scholastic on October 19th. 1872. A short news brief says the following very succinct update, quote, the Minims have a Minim football and keep it a rolling, end quote. (laughs) So some of you may be thinking, what the hell are Minims and what does this even mean? Does he mean minnows? Well, not at all. The University of Notre Dame used to have multiple departments, which included modern day equivalents of grades 5 through 12, called the junior department, there was the elementary school department, and then, of course, the senior department, which was the college-aged men. So, as you might have guessed, the Minims were the elementary schoolers. So, the University of Notre Dame, you could theoretically have started school there at kindergarten age and stayed all the way through college. I'm not sure a lot of people know that, but we've touched on the Minim department before on the show, but still a good refresher. So, it was at least a good 15 years before the first game that a football was first kicked on the campus of Notre Dame, at least a documented mention. But in that very same news brief, it talks about the junior class celebrating St. Edward's Day with a game of football, with the grand prize being a barrel of apples to the winning team. So the first documented pitched football game on Notre Dame's campus was played for apples. But where'd the apples come from, though? That brings us to another point. In 1867, Father Edward Soren purchased a 1,300-acre farm seven miles northwest of campus, which he called St. Joseph's Farm, and it's still in use today. According to a recent issue of the Alumni Magazine, one of the priests who worked at the farm in the 1990s said, quote, I would think the legacy is that the farm was the life and blood of Notre Dame. He said, in the early years, the farm provided milk, eggs, apples, and meat for Notre Dame. The brothers made the altar wine for the basilica. The farm took care of them right from the beginning. End quote. So undoubtedly, the prize apples were picked from the orchards of St. Joseph's Farm. And football for apples continued in future years as well. For instance, 1874. Two years after that first documented game was played. Again, according to the school newspaper, quote, A game of football was played, October 24th, in the junior yard for a barrel of apples. Hayes' side, or his team, beat Best's and won the apples, end quote. So I thought this was cool, not just, of course, because of the apples, again, serving as a prize, but also the early footballers being called by name. 
So I dug into the annual catalog, which features the student muster roll, just to figure out who these lads were. So the first identified captains on Notre Dame's campus were Philip L. Best of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and John S. Hayes of Chicago, Illinois. So they are the first team captains of Notre Dame football teams, at least identified. And these football games continued on Notre Dame's campus throughout the 1870s and 1880s, and oftentimes the clashes were between the junior and senior classes. And this game kind of became a de facto campus tradition during those decades. Think of it like, I guess this might be not a great example, but you know how Powder Puff plays once a year, uh, junior versus senior class. But yes, apples frequently served as the grand prize. And I thought not only finding out when football first arrived to campus, but what these students played for was pretty cool. And I'll be right back with anecdote number two. All right, I'll admit number two may be a little bit personal, so it may be half anecdote, half rant. I'm a huge, huge fan of of turn-of-the-century Notre Dame fullback-turned-coach Lewis Salmon, also known as Red. Not only is the show's episode number 32 about him, but I'm actually working on writing his literal biography right now. So this one kind of pertains to him more than just a little bit, But the first point is actually about a man, the man, who served as the first, we'll call it, professional coach in program history. So during the early seasons of Notre Dame football, the position of, quote, head coach could be a little puzzling. Some seasons there weren't any. Others it was a part-time gig, and, and even others it was a player fulfilling that role. So I get it. Confusion is very easily bred. There's oral records and there's written records that conflict with the oral records. And then there's other written records that conflict with other written records. So sometimes you just have to be willing to put your nose to the grindstone, so to speak, to find some real answers. However, if you were to crack open the 2021 Notre Dame Football Media Guide, there are three glaring errors in the early years of the program as far as who was actually serving in the role as head coach. And I'm not trying to be a heel over this, but one probably deserves at the very least an asterisk, and the other is just plain incorrect. But in 1894, Notre Dame hired its first head coach. That was James L. Morrison on a two-week, $40 per week contract. And this is all in the permanent record. It's easy to confirm. There's some written correspondence that Coach Morrison wrote to friends. All this, like, there's no doubt. He came in for this two-week, $40 per week contract contract. So he dutifully coaches the Notre Dame lads for the first two games of the 1894 season, a victory over Hillsdale College on October 13th and a tie against Albion College on October 20th. With his contract up, he then leaves the program and it's confirmed by the school newspaper who actually thank him for his time on campus and affirm he would be leaving campus on October 22nd. Quote, Mr. Morrison, our coach, leaves us on Monday. For his work among us, certainly he deserves the thanks of all interested in football. He has labored hard to give us a proper knowledge of the game and to inspire us with enthusiasm for the sport. If our team should be defeated during the rest of the season, no blame will attach to him. Never in the history of athletics at Notre Dame has an 11 been better trained. It rests now with the captain and his men to continue practice on the lines mapped out by the coach. Mr. Morrison will go to Hillsdale to train their 11. We trust he may find time to pay us an occasional visit. He will always find a warm welcome awaiting him. End quote. So Morrison leaves after two games to coach Hillsdale, who his team defeated in that first game. And without a coach, the team wouldn't actually play another game for about a month. And they'd play three more in November. And they'd go 2-1 and one without him to finish the season 3-1-1. One, and one. So as it were, Morrison is actually credited with the entire season's record in the official media guide. And again, I hate to be a heel, but he coached less than half of the season's games. So I'm of the opinion there ought to be a note in the program with an asterisk or something. Just to denote that Coach Morrison was there only for the first two games. And you might be thinking, Alex, man, don't be such a stickler about this. But... The official record is just that. It's the official record 
and it should go to great lengths to accurately portray correct information, especially if that correct information is pretty easily accessible. So that was 1894. Moving forward to 1902 and 1903, in the annals of Notre Dame football history, including again in the media guide, James Farragher is named the head coach for those two seasons and is credited with a 14-2-2 record. And unfortunately, this is also not true. So let's start with the 1902 season, for instance. The newspaper corroborates that Farragher didn't even make it to South Bend until three days after the first game of the season. He had played for Notre Dame in 1901, and he had actually returned to South Bend in 1902 to play for the football team. But he was denied, so he actually went out for the South Bend Athletics, a semi-pro football team. And being a lineman himself, he actually helped coach the offensive and defensive lines. So when examining the 1902 annual football review, Farragher is named three times in the publication, but never as head coach, only as line coach. Team captain, Lewis Salmon, on the other hand, indeed served in the role as head coach. And I can say this somewhat bold claim as someone who has read nearly every issue of the school newspaper at this time, and this is how he was treated in print. Not only did he serve as the spokesman of the team, but he is also the one who directed and planned all the practices. Take the 1902 game against Michigan, for example. This was the biggest game of the season, by a far cry, played at a neutral site in Toledo, Ohio. Yet, it's all week that Salmon is the one speaking to the media and is leading practice. Red actually caught a little bit of controversy because he shut the practice facility gates and didn't allow media to observe practice that week. And when practice had concluded, it was Salmon who swung the gates open and again spoke to the media. So for Red Salmon, in 1902, his team captaincy equated to head coach. Now sure, he had help from others like Farragher, but he was the de facto head coach, even if it wasn't ideal or part of the plan. In 1962, so about six decades later, Red, who was a very quiet person, actually wrote the Notre Dame Treasury and explained that in 1902 and 1903, Father Andrew Morrissey never actually hired a head coach. And it was kind of expected that there'd be a collection of assistants, but that the team captain would serve as the head coach. And that team captain was, of course, Red Salmon. So let's talk about 1903. One year later, Salmon is a senior and still a captain, and somehow Farragher, though he is credited as head coach in the official history, is not even mentioned once, not once, in the annual football review, nor is he mentioned in the school newspaper at any point during the football season. And the school newspaper very dutifully covered every single football game. So what's more, here is a quote from the football review that year. Quote, Captain Salmon was entrusted with the task of coaching his men as well as playing. It was an undertaking sufficient to test the mettle of any man. But Salmon, with that sturdy resoluteness that has characterized his playing in many a hard-fought gridiron battle, bravely set himself to the work before him. And aided by the good spirit of his teammates, succeeded not only in rounding the team into form, but also in turning out the most successful 11 that has ever represented Notre Dame, end quote. And that is a huge mic drop. That sounds like the head coach to me. And again, once more, James Farragher was not even mentioned in the school paper nor the annual football review for the entire season. And that is because Red Salmon was the head coach. And why is this significant, Irish fans? That 1903 team is remembered for going undefeated, eight wins, zero losses, and one tie, and unscored on for the entire year. So I think this is of incredible circumstance, and why do I care again, aside from just being very close to the subject, Red is someone who's been criminally overlooked in program history. He was the first person ever from Notre Dame named to Walter Camp's All-American list. And I'm not alone in this sentiment, actually. Murray Sperber asserts it was Red who coached the team in 1902 and 1903 as well. He even goes as far as calling Farragher a ghost 
and writes that since he was a popular policeman on campus in the 1930s, when a lot of Notre Dame football history was actually first being written, his name is elevated to head coach during this time. So if you're to count 1902 and 1903 in with 1904, when Red actually is credited with being the head coach of the team, his career coaching record should be 19 wins, 5 losses, and 2 ties. Now, again, perhaps this was less of an anecdote and more of a rant, and I'm not trying to put the sports information department at the University of Notre Dame's athletic department on blast here, but I think it's high time we clean this one up just a little bit. So, number three anecdote right after this. All right, the third anecdote is a little bit of a shorter one, at least short compared to the one before. But since we're talking about the early 1900s in Notre Dame football, let's bump forward just a little bit to 1905. Though the team itself was somewhat unspectacular with a 5-4 record, kind of a backslide as far as how good they were in the previous seasons, but how about the absolute drubbing they put on the American College of Medicine and Surgery? How bad of a drubbing? Well, the most points in school history with a 142-0 to zero victory on October 28th, 1905. Under the tutelage of former player Fuzzy McGlue, which it doesn't get much more Irish than my dude Fuzzy, they laid the absolute beat down on some med school students. And when the schools had played each other three years earlier in 1902, Notre Dame actually carried that day by a 92-0 to zero score. At the time, each half was 25 minutes long, but the game itself was so lopsided that the second half was only eight minutes long because, quote, the doctors must eat before catching their train, and anyway, the score suited them as it stood, end quote. It should be noted that the score was 111 to zero at the half, so I suppose it must have suited them well enough. But yes, 142 to nothing. And yeah, I would hope they wouldn't want to give up any more. But so given the shortened second half, that means Notre Dame scored 142 points in 33 minutes. That's 4.3 points per minute. A total bloodbath. And reportedly, each Notre Dame offensive series was anywhere between one and four plays before scoring a touchdown. So they just ran absolute roughshod over the med school students. So speaking of, touchdowns were scored by 11 different players, 10 of whom scored multiple times. So this game is obviously absurd for a number of reasons, the score, of course, being the biggest. But as I was looking through the box score of that game... There were 27 touchdowns scored. Just wild. But Notre Dame was only successful on seven of their extra point attempts. So they missed 20 extra points. Count them up. 20 on that October 28th, 1905 day. So even in their most dominant victory in program history, they actually left quite a few points on the field. So... How about the best quarterback in Notre Dame history that you probably haven't heard of? Coming up right after this. I very carefully threw out the word probably never heard of, but I do think there is a solid chance that perhaps, I don't know, 60 to 70% of Notre Dame fans have very little or even perhaps no familiarity with this guy we're about to talk about. Now, I'm going to give you five seconds to think of some of the very best quarterbacks in Notre Dame history that you can think of. Ready, set, go. All right, so there's five seconds. Now, perhaps you thought of any number of the following. Angelo Bertelli, Johnny Lujak, Paul Horning, Bob Williams, John Hewitt, Joe Theismann, Joe Montana, Rick Meyer, Brady Quinn, Tony Rice, Terry Hanratty, Steve Beerline, and of course, Ian Book. But do you want to know who left the program as the most prolific quarterback in program history? 
I guess technically that could be a couple guys, but the one that we didn't mention is a gentleman by the name of Ralph Guglielmi, who started for the Irish between 1952 through 1954. And I really think he gets kind of lost in the shuffle because he's sandwiched in between Heisman winning quarterbacks Johnny Lujak and Paul Horning, and he shared a backfield with another Heisman winner in running back Johnny Latner in 1953. So you can see how that easily kind of happened. Though I would be remiss not to mention that Ralph himself finished fourth in the Heisman Trophy voting his senior year in 1954. And call me crazy, but I think as the hands of time or the the pages of history have turned, I think he's also kind of glossed over for something else. And I think it's because people may see his last name and have no clue how to pronounce it. It's spelled G-U-G-L-I-E-L-M-I, and it's pronounced Guglielmi. And hey, listen, I'll be the first to tell you, it doesn't look like it should be pronounced Guglielmi. And I once read a psychological study where humans don't favor words nor names that are hard to pronounce or that are kind of ambiguous. So I don't know. That might be a very, very far-fetched or half-baked theory, but that's one that I know that it took me a while to get the hang of pronouncing his name and seeing it, and that's what his name was. But I also think another component is that they didn't win a national championship during the 1952, 1953, and 1954 years. However, they did finish third, second, and then fourth during those seasons. But the Columbus, Ohio native left the program as the most productive passer in program history, as I mentioned. So this is according to the late Lou Samoji of Inside ND Sports, quote, As a junior in 1953, Guglielmi was one-fourth of what many historians believe was the greatest backfield in Notre Dame annals, with all four top nine NFL draft picks. Heisman Trophy winner Johnny Latner and fullback Neil Warden were drafted 7th and ninth, respectively in 1954, while Guglielmi was number four in 1955, with a classmate Joe Heap coming in at number eight in 1955. However, that senior year in 1954 almost didn't occur when Guglielmi and Heap, who was a three-time academic All-American, were expelled from school for the second semester, end quote. Wait, what? That's true. After celebrating the end of the 1953 season, the two All-Americans stayed out past curfew, arriving back to Notre Dame's campus at 3 a.m., And they were promptly kicked out of school. Worse yet, they lost all their credits for the fall semester. So listen to this. Not only did Ralph have to take 12 credit hours during the summer, which is typical for a a semester for a lot of people, but he had to take 20 credit hours during the 1954 football season in order to graduate on time. 20 credit hours is absolutely brutal. Perhaps there's some in the listening audience who have taken 20 credit hours in a college semester, and you could probably speak on that. I think my personal record was 17 and a half, and I was miserable. (laughs) So let's give Ralph even more credit for finishing fourth in the Heisman that season. But when his career was over, his career passing marks were 209 completions on 436 attempts, both of those were Notre Dame records at the time. He threw for 3,117 yards, which broke Angelo Bertelli's Notre Dame career mark for passing yards, and he threw for 18 touchdowns. And he also rushed for 200 yards and 12 touchdowns, kicked five point after attempts, and intercepted 10 passes for 98 yards and a touchdown. And Guglielmi actually led the team in interceptions with five each in 1953 and 1954. He also recovered two fumbles, but can you imagine sending your quarterback out who is a Heisman, you know, a Heisman candidate to play defense? I mean, that was commonplace though. And the fact that he went out and he was such a playmaker on defense actually aids his legacy a little bit. But uh, as mentioned, he was taken in the first round of the 1955 NFL draft, and he would eventually be inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 2001. Ralph Guglielmi died in 2017 at the age of 83. So, henceforward, when talking to your pals about 
great Notre Dame quarterbacks. Man, let's stop sleeping on Ralph Guglielmi. The Great Milk Riot of 1952, right after this. I'm just going to own it. I actually ran into this anecdote as I was doing some research about the subject of the previous anecdote, Ralph Guglielmi. So this is actually from a book. It's called The Forgotten Four. Now, I mentioned in the last anecdote about that backfield, Joe Heap, Neil Warden, Johnny Latner, and Ralph Guglielmi being one of the most unheralded yet best backfields in Notre Dame history. And I put it pretty high on the list myself. But there was actually a book written about these gentlemen as a conglomerate. It's called The Forgotten Four. And it was written by Donald J. Hubbard and Mark O. Hubbard, uh, who are actually both Notre Dame graduates. So I'm actually going to lift this anecdote directly from that book. But I just thought it was too good not to share. So here we go. Quote, The Great Milk Riot happened on February 28, 1952, in the dining hall. Traditionally, Notre Dame men were allotted five glasses of milk each day from a 10-ounce glass. Two at breakfast, one at lunch, and two at dinner. The practice stopped on February 28th at dinner when the students began to receive their two dinnertime glasses from eight-ounce glasses for the first time. So why the change? The university later stated that the administration had decided that the students had wasted too much milk during the day drinking from the large glasses. So, born out of a concern for conservation, the slightly smaller glasses were purchased and introduced to the students. It is difficult to believe this because at the time, Notre Dame had not reached its financial status of, to excuse the pun, becoming a cash cow. It was on the verge of realizing millions of dollars from Novo rich alumni donations and from the sale of every fighting Irish novelty and creation. But at the time, the school more closely resembled the Depression-era college that had almost folded, but for the introduction of the naval courses and training during World War II. As an economic measure, the smaller glasses provided a bust. Quite spontaneously, students figured out that their finite allotment of milk had shrunk even more, and the hated glasses began to get smashed against the floor of the dining hall by angered students. The shorter and squatter glasses did not break as easily as the older glasses, so the university's bowlers began to stack the glasses up at the end of a long, varnished wooden table in pyramid fashion, only to be busted down by a single glass whipped down the table like a bowling ball. No one kept count, but apparently few gutter balls resulted in hundred broken glasses began to fragment on the floor of the venerable dining hall. Feeding the rage were rumors that the administration had added saltpeter to the milk to lower the amorous ardor of the young men. Just as a quick note, this is written by two lawyers, and you can kind of tell. <laughs> And when some claimed their milk poured out foamier than the previous day's fare, this apparently confirmed their most deeply seated fears. Satisfied that they had not only received less milk, but also sex-inhibiting liquid because salt Peter was actually given to servicemen in order to allegedly curb their sexual appetites, one of the ringleaders yelled out, and I apologize for the language, but he said, we're not going to drink this shit, which of course prompted half of the glasses smashing against the wall and floors. So the revolt continued outside when several students palmed the glasses and removed them from the dining hall, only to smash them against the rust-colored exterior brick. As many as 800 glasses shattered that night. Father Charles McCarriger, who was known as Black Mac McCarriger to the students, who was the vice president of student affairs, most likely went into a meltdown that evening in order to squelch the insurrection, but... Most likely, he would have had to have dismissed over 90% of the student body who resided on campus. And uh, he would have done it too, but cooler heads, like that of Father Ted Hesburg, prevailed. The South Bend Tribune picked up the story, and soon the New York Times ran a piece. To curtail the embarrassment to the university, Father Hesburg met with the students to address two pressing concerns. The smaller milk glasses and the lack of toilet paper in the dorms. Father Hesburgh did not defend very strenuously the glass issue, but he did point out that since toilet paper had been thrown as streamers at football games, 
not much was left to meet the purpose for which the paper was intended. <laughs> since the football season had long since concluded, the toilet paper was not likely to be thrown around the stadium for at least another seven months. So that issue easily rectified itself. Because the 8-ounce glasses had largely and almost completely disappeared from campus, the university had little choice but to restore the larger glasses, and the revolt was quickly suppressed through almost total abdication by the administration to the student body. It's tempting to ascribe too much significance to the milk riot, that it constituted some deep-seated revolt against the strictness of the university and the faith on the cusp of Vatican II. Mostly, it began as a spontaneous revolt more likely directed against the quite long and harsh Indiana winters, a rage less against the machine and more against nature itself. Perhaps it had something to do with the leap year, as more and more ND young men figured out that the women of their daydreams did not intend to ask for their hand in marriage that year. Whatever the cause, the students had won a small and immature battle, one they never forgot, and it proved to be the last one for some time. End quote. Absolutely amazing anecdote. So thank you to the Hubbard brothers and their book Forgotten Four, which was again about that backfield from the mid-50s, but had that awesome anecdote. So if you have an opportunity to pick up Forgotten Four by the Hubbard brothers, go for it. It's obviously chock full of great stories. All right, well, this has been kind of a fun episode to put together. I hope you've enjoyed it. So let's wrap this thing up here right after this. Just a couple quick reminders. Do not forget to head over to the Facebook page at facebook.com slash Onward to Victory podcast to like and follow. And that way you get all of the latest show updates. If you are interested in getting a 2022 show t-shirt, man, head over to paypal.me slash Onward to Victory and leave your address and your shirt size that you prefer. And we will get you a show shirt courtesy of wcscreens.com. The shirts themselves, including shipping, are actually only $25. What a bargain. And like I mentioned earlier, if you want to join the Consensus All-Americans, you can actually visit that exact same site. Again, paypal.me slash onward to victory or patreon.com slash onward to victory podcast. And again, those are the virtual tip jars, if you will. So leave a donation. I will call you out as a Consensus All-American, as someone who kind of keeps the show on the Subway alumni tracks. But I hope you appreciated and enjoyed Alex's Irish Anecdotes Volume 1. I think there will be at least a Volume 2 because I've got some ideas for Volume 2. But if you have anything that you might be interested in having me dig into across the history of Notre Dame or the Notre Dame football team, don't hesitate to reach out via Facebook or the email address at onwardtovictorypodcast at gmail.com. I'd be happy to entertain anyone's thoughts or anyone's ideas, and actually I'd welcome them. So what's coming down the pike here for the show? Well, we're getting actually really close to the season kicking off. We are inside of eight weeks. So the fourth annual season preview episode will be coming out sometime next month in August, and I'll probably be bringing in my pal and co-host Matt Gehring for that. That way we can break it down as much as we can, position group by position group, game by game. And then I also have an episode about the Basilica of the Sacred Heart in the Hopper as well. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that very noteworthy landmark on Notre Dame's campus, one that hundreds of thousands of people come through every year to tour, well, you just stay tuned. I got something real special in store for you. But I'm really appreciative, again, that you all decided to hang out for this time and learn a little bit more about your favorite college football program. And again, I'm appreciative that you stuck around, even though this episode was formatted a bit differently. But I think it was a good change of pace and one that I'll probably be bringing back here very soon. So, man, we got a really exciting football season coming up. The beginning, the formal beginning of the Marcus Freeman era and I know everyone's just chomping at the bit, and if you're following the recruiting classes, man, they're looking good as well. The sun is shining awful bright on Notre Dame football right now, and we are just so happy to be along for the ride. So with that, I better wrap it up. This has been Onward to Victory, a Notre Dame football podcast, and in kindness, I am your host, Alex 
painter. And as always, go Irish. Irish.